There is an old saying, it is not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. We're told that sport is good for physical and mental well-being, but what is the effect on children if it is too competitive? Does it teach them vital skills to deal with the rough and tumble of life or cause life-limiting self-doubt? You're watching Round Table with me, David Foster. Well, most of us with children have spent time on the side of a sports field or a court cheering on our offspring. Nothing wrong with a bit of healthy competition. So at what point could it become harmful? And what are the implications for those children when they become adults? The drive to win. The French had it in Moscow. Djokovic had it again at Wimbledon. Competitive sports are crucial in teaching young people how to function in a team. But recent UK surveys show teenagers would be happy not to have to compete. So is it healthy to instill a win-at-all-costs mentality in young people? Are there wider societal shifts making our kids recoil from competition? Donald Trump might stray from convention on most policy fronts, but one area where his views are conventional is on the value of competitive sports. Participating in sports builds character, forges friendships, tears down barriers, and brings people from all walks of life closer together. Former Man United coach Alex Ferguson said football was an engine of social mobility and that it incubates meritocracy. Useful attributes, perhaps, in a country such as Britain. Divisions between the privately and state-educated can be stark there. A disproportionate number of the country's Olympic medalists come from private schools. Fallout, too, perhaps, from the government's sale of more than 10,000 school playing fields over the past 35 years. A survey by a UK charity Chance to Shine showed that 64% of 8 to 16 year olds would be relieved and happy if winning and losing were not a factor in sports. In April this year, high-flying England cricketer Zafar Ansari retired early at the age of 25. He cited the need to be permanently competitive as something he struggled with. Ansari spoke of his wariness at a professional culture that treated the uncompromising pursuit of victory as essentially virtuous. So is Ansari's case unique or part of a wider cultural shift? 57% of British parents with primary school children said that winning was banned at their sports days. This despite 82% of parents wanting there to be competition and winners. Many psychologists say that some form of competition for children is healthy. It provides valuable life lessons that they have to learn to be able to lose as well as win. So is there an intrinsic value to the free and fair competition of sports? Or are we just adding to the strains on our youngsters? They now live in a world of precarious employment, drastically reduced access to housing, not to mention the pressures of social media. Is the compulsion to perform and succeed exerting too great a toll? Or is it a question of striking the right balance? Sport, 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 a metaphor for life. Perhaps we'll be talking about that, among other things, with Mike Selvey. He's joining us via Skype from Buckinghamshire. Mike played cricket for England and was a cricket writer too. Emily Reynolds is with us, head of sport at the Youth Sports Trust. Also a former secondary school physical education teacher, we welcome Montel Douglas, the first British woman to be selected for both Summer and Winter Olympics, and Adam White from the Department of Sport and Health Sciences at Oxford Brooks University. Thank you all very much indeed for coming on. Let's go to Montel first of all, since you are the only practicing athlete at this table, myself included, uh, and ask you what you think competitive sport taught you and where you felt it had gone too far. 
I think competitive sport's always been a huge part of my, my life. I think most people's lives, when you grow up younger, you know, the first, my first ever sports day, uh, I remember competing always um, with the boys at school, um, just because um, my teacher said to me I was beating all the girls. And, and from then on, it was always for me about pushing on and, and doing my absolute best. Um, but it's definitely been part of my life, and it's been actually one of the things that has led me to achieve a lot of the things that I wanted to when I was younger, but didn't actually think were possible. Has it always been a good thing, the competition? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, for, for me it has. And I think for a lot of athletes, we absolutely love competing. You know, the buzz of that, the thrill, and actually just performing at your best. Um, most of us don't like the training, it's, that's the difficult part. Well, what about when you lose? <laughs> when you lose, I think it's how you perceive losing. I think we're so focused on the outcome and whether we are win or lose. But I always see, you, know, you, you don't really, you win or you learn. Um, most of the time when I've not performed at my best and I've, I've lost races, mm. um, I've just looked at what I've actually gained. Because there's a chap I used to work for who he, he died last week, but he, he said in his lifetime, he said, show me a good loser and I'll simply show you a loser. Um, Mike, what do you make of competition in sport? Is it essential or is it something that you can pick and choose from depending on who, the person is at school and at school age and so on. Uh, well, I mean, you, you used what's well, actually uh, <laughs> a cliche, isn't it? It's a metaphor for life. Um, the sport is a subset of what goes on in the real world. Um, I think, you know, I came from a, uh, a competitive sporting background, if you want to call it that, a long time ago. And it was a fairly restrictive um, choice that I had. I mean, I, that's, that's another element which I, maybe we could get onto is, is, is choice. I mean, mine was restricted. I played. I played cricket in the summer and I played football in the winter and I was a pretty good footballer. I was a much better cricketer. Um, and, and my own experience of that, of course, is that it was essential to my, to my upbringing. Now, that's speaking from the, the viewpoint of somebody who was, who was quite good at sport. I can't really speak from what my contemporaries who weren't so good felt uh, of it because they were, they were doing the same sports as I was doing. Um, so I, I can't really but, okay. articulate how they will have felt at that let, time. Let, let me ask you this then, because you, you played for England, um, you were a fast bowler, you got some important wickets, um, your career yeah. lasted for, it was a fairly short career, but you were a county player for a very long time. And in that time at county level, you would have experienced the company of a lot of people who were never going to make it at international <coughs> level. Um, so sport can be very dispiriting too, and what damage does that do? We don't have to make it international level to be competitive. You know, I, I was never anything other than competitive in uh, every single game of cricket I ever played, from from the very first one I played to the very last one I played. You know, I played uh, in one all oh, a couple of years ago at my at my um, uh, my younger son's school, and I played in that, and I, I I wanted to compete in that game even at my age. I still wanted to to compete. That you never lose that element of that. Um, and, and I also think throughout my, my professional life beyond cricket as a journalist, which is, uh, oh, crikey, 30 odd years now, um, I, that was a competitive element too, because you, you're competing against your rival mm. newspapers, you're competing against rival um, organisations, rival media outlets, you want to provide the best thing. So I always try to do that. And, and, and that, it, it teaches you something. I'm going to come back to that last cricket match you ever played because you, you put down in print uh, what actually happened and why you then retired. And I'm going to remind you of that at, towards the end of the programme. Emily, what are the bad things about pushing people into competitive sport at an early age? I think it's really about, from, from the work that we do with schools, it's about recognising that to compete, there needs to be a playing field and pushing young people out of the competence level that they, they can operate within isn't necessarily a good thing. And that means sometimes if you are over competitive, that's whether it's parents or teachers, young people who aren't motivated by it or aren't um, competent at the level, if they, if they don't want to be a, a, a national champion, if they don't want to be a county finalist, then, then actually pushing them too far can turn them off, not only just from being an athlete, but being physically active for life. So the balance but between... But does it also put them off perhaps standing up to other people and, and being measured against other people because they think they're not going to be good enough? I think there's an easy let out clause to put competitive school sport as the piece that means that they won't have those things. We had the discussion earlier around if I'm a young person who gets a, a, an E in my grades or an A in my grades, that's competition in an academic sense. Yeah. Do, we, do, we make, do we argue the case that they're put off and not able and encouraged? The so sport is a arena where competition can occur. It's not the only arena. Um, and I, 
organisationally and personally, I believe, the things that, um, just reflecting on peers that have played sport, I competed with school friends, going way back, um, who never had the aspiration to do more than play school sport. Are they physically active now? Are they good barristers and have they learnt lessons positively from an appropriate competitive experience in school? I'd say probably yes. Yes, OK. Yeah. And, and have we changed our attitude to competitive sport in this country? Because we don't like to see losers anymore because it damages self-esteem. I mean, it was, it was nothing, it was never discussed when I was at school. I think there's a you may have guessed is <laughs> I think there's a recognition that there has been an increased focus across state and independent on competitive school sport based on the investment mm. within it um, and actually making conscientious decisions around um, what environment is it appropriate to put young people into is a good thing saying you can't have winning on a school sports day isn't necessarily a conversation I think we should be having. Should they be winning against, um, should they be recognising their personal progress? Yes. Do we always, um, what question does a parent ask a child when they finish competing? Um, did you win? Um, if they come back from a football tournament and they're the goalkeeper, did you score a goal in lots of cases because it's the outcome, it's the result that, that people are interested in? Or did you get to put into practice something you've tried at training this week? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Well, that's a bit of a long sentence, but yeah. I mean, I think, did you have fun is probably yeah, the, did you probably have the, fun, the better. Did you, you know. But Adam, there's only ever going to be one winner. There is. You have to prepare people for losing. Well, we, we say that we have to prepare people for losing, and, and I'm fairly certain that, that that's a myth. Um, we don't sit there in schools and we don't go, right, we're going to put your exam results on the wall outside the school so everybody in the community can see them. We don't turn around and put our politicians on rankings in, in the public domain. We don't... Well, we sort of do, don't we? <laughs> well, and we, we, don't put our, we don't at work put our PDR results on the wall so everybody in the workplace can see what we're doing. We hide our salaries and lots of the information is hidden. So why do we expect that eight, nine, ten-year-old children should be forced to suffer their losses in public? Well, I tell you, I, I, I'll postulate that the one reason we do it is because it's going to happen to them one day and you might as well teach them how to deal with it. Well, I, I'd argue that it doesn't happen one day. Um, often they don't have such public losses, they don't have time to, you know, that we, we put a lot of pressure on these young people, and especially in some of the, the schools, and especially the, the, the independent sector, where that's part of the selling package. They sell their, their school to parents based upon the sporting success. Um, I think that's... So how are you going about it? What's your approach now? What's my approach? I think, I think sport can be really good. Um, I think there are lots of benefits to sport. It's fun, and that's the biggest benefit. We're all here because we've enjoyed sport, we've had a great time, but we're the ones that benefit from it. We really need to be speaking to the young children out there that hate sport, disengage with it from an early age, because they're the ones that are dropping out, not participating, that we're worried about lifelong activity-wise. How about, how about this? The MCC, the Marylebone Cricket Club, a Chance to Shine charity, this is a couple of years ago, said that two-thirds of 8- to 16-year-olds said they would be, quote, relieved, not bothered or happier if winning or, loser were not, winning or losing were not a factor. Do you recognise that? Personally, I think for me, no, because I, I never really placed a lot. Like we said, we're talking about winning and losing, we're talking about uh, having fun. And for me, very much so, it was 100% about having fun. And mm -hmm. I think my fun just happened to lead me, lead me to Olympic Games. But th those aspirations weren't necessarily there. I wasn't someone who absolutely d needed to compete. I needed to push. But I did enjoy um, like practicing something that I absolutely loved. I did enjoy getting better at it. And I, I think the, the focus on it is, w is what... We kind of we, we miss a lot of that. We're focusing on the things that are actually really negative, but forgetting about the things that it, it gives you, like the resilience for me to be able to bounce back. You know, doing sport in a whole, being active, can be difficult. You know, you could slip downstairs and sprain your ankle, but you still have to. Um, without doing sport, you still have to get back. As an athlete, you know, injuries, things like that. You overcome those things, and they're the things that have taught me to. So be how able do you look on people who can't on. do it? Who How can't? Do you, yeah, do you, See, do, I don't do, think do you anyone sort of can't do it. I, I don't think anyone <laughs> can't do it. I feel that people choose not to. I feel that people don't. And it's not for everyone, you know. It's not everyone likes sport. But I totally agree with Emily was saying about being physically active. For me, it's about creating these beautiful, wonderful early habits to say, actually, sport doesn't have to be the beyond end all. Competition doesn't have to be the end all. It's about creating those habits where you're enjoying having fun, you're enjoying moving around and being active. How about this? Um, I'm coming back to you, Mike, and it's family favourites yeah. for you for you on this programme. <laughs> can, it, can it be damaging to somebody if they are good at sport and then they're told 
it doesn't matter. And I'm thinking about a story you once wrote about uh, one of your children, one of your daughters. Tell us what yeah. it was. Hannah is a triplet. And she was uh, competing for her school in, in a school athletics event against other schools. Um, she won a race, an 800 meter race, very, very, very comfortably. And it was a representative, um, the selections I think were made, for, and you, you're bringing this piece up from quite a long while ago, so I, I'm, I'm a bit hazy 2007 on 2007 you wrote it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, she she didn't get selected in a, in a team on the basis of that performance because they had to have an eclectic um, mix in the side. And, and I got very angry about that, actually, because I thought, what is the point? And the reason I mentioned um, the, the fact that she was a triplet was because one of my um, my sons, um, her, her sibling, uh, has, has uh, hemiplegia, so cerebral palsy. And Adam, all his life, has competed very strongly against two able-bodied siblings. And I rang him up this morning to ask him about this, um, this, this very subject we're talking about here. Uh, and he was quite adamant that uh, he didn't find it uncomfortable to, to have to compete, that it served him um, pretty well. He's actually um, he's competed at Stoke Mandeville, for example, in the past. Um, he's quite a talented athlete, as it turns out. You, 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 you might try to take runs. He can run 10, 12, six minute miles. He's, he's pretty blooming good. Um, but he's he knows that he couldn't compete on a on a certain level but in his own mind he's always been competing and he and he still is competing let me ask and you I this mike uh, if, I, if i can jump butt in um you hoped that hannah would cope with her disappointment do you think it made her a better person having to realize that life's not fair well i think she, she was she was young enough and she she eventually succeeded in in answers you know she took up on the, on the back of that um school that she went to um which was very very strong Cross country, um, because the teachers decided that it was going to be a cross country school. Um, you know, we're talking about introducing kids to sport and keep, keeping them active. It was so easy for schools to, to say, "Well, we just stick them outside and give them a football to kick around." They didn't do that. They insisted that the kids, all of them, did cross country running at some stage. And they, from that, they discovered that there were some really talented kids who would never ever have dreamed of doing that. Um, is there any circumstances? under which you see it becoming normal where there is no competitive sport in, in school? We'd really hope not, because for the Adams and the Hannahs who've had those benefits and the Montels who've had the benefits and myself who've had benefits, I think choice is really important. But Mike referenced there that every child had to do cross country and compete. Now, three children are referenced as having a really positive experience and going on and do something different. What I think we've done as a, as a charity and many other organisations have done is make sure that there's choice in the offer for young people. So lots of schools now, the variety in the, the legacy, I suppose, of London 20. 12 has meant it's not only the, the traditional school sports that are on offer and that are there to compete. In September, the launch of two new sports into the school games, which is a Sport England um, National Lottery funded programme, means that Ultimate Frisbee and um, Lawn Bowls are being introduced for school children. Well, they couldn't be more. Polar opposites. They? But you look <laughs> at Ultimate too? Frisbee and, you know, the, the thing there is there's no referees in Ultimate Frisbee. It's a self-refereed game. So you talk about the integrity of sport and decisions being made. Actually, we've got a really good opportunity for young people to learn that they can control yeah. their own boundaries. They don't need to be adults right. on the sidelines saying this is right, this is wrong. But for the game to be fair, um, when you come back to play in the playground, um, actually young people compete all of the time, whether that's playing tag whether that's play in touch from a little uh, age, I'm going to race you to that tree. Their rules, it's sport, but in a play format. And I think one of the things that needs to be a, a bigger discussion topic is when do adult rules become what young people have to abide by in competitive school I mean, do, do jump in and, and yeah, answer that, any you know, points that, that, that you're, for you're, me you're is each a... one of you's making. I've got my questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, I think there's a real so, Same for you, Mike. Jump in and ask questions if you want discussion, to. And yeah. a chance to shine, do some amazing work around redefining cricket for certain demographics within certain environments. That hooks them into what could be an adult version of the game. But the yeah. exciting piece is 
child stage appropriate. Yeah, and I, totally yeah. I think it's, uh, it's an important point you make about choice. Actually, I really do believe that. You know, we're going back um, to to Hannah. There, we're talking about. Uh, uh, 11 years ago now, and things have moved on an awful lot since then. Um, I think it's really important that, that kids of a young age do get plenty of choice and that their decisions aren't made for them by their parents. Uh, and I also think it's absolutely um, axiomatic to the, to the, the whole debate that, that children um, children's sport is not a reflection of their parents' ambitions for them. In other words, they don't. the parents' ambitions are manifested through through their children's sports. I think it's for the children that, to decide yeah. themselves whether they want to compete or whether they want to do a sport or take up what might I be come, sport. come to you in might just a moment, if I may, but, but Adam has been quiet for, for a little while and no, did no, want no, to no. say something. No, I, I think it, it's really heartwarming to hear about this idea of choice, um, and, and that's what I'd absolutely agree with. I think children should be the ones that make the choice about the sports they play. Um, we've just conducted a study in the last couple of years about secondary school physical education and found that 93% of boys are compelled by their schools to participate in contact rugby, despite knowing that it has a higher risk of injury than all other sports within schools, including trampolining, um, and despite some of those injuries not being known to us yet, even the medical professionals are not 100% certain on what concussion is, how to manage it, how to deal with it. So I think whilst we, we have this idea of choice, and I think parents and, and those within sport and, and us as adults might agree with that, that's not what it looks like in schools, and that's really quite worrying. And there's a programme you've got at the moment with regard to rugby, yep. which is where the, the end result of the game doesn't really matter. It's a values game. What is that? Well, well rugby represent itself is, is a game that develops um, certain values, whether that's teamwork, respect, um, enjoyment, discipline and sportsmanship uh, are, are the ones that they've, they've promoted. Um, and, of course, they, rugby will promote those things, as will all sport, as will dance and drama and art and any event that involves working in a team as a group for a shared goal. Um, I guess my, my perspective would be what, sport can be great, physical activity really is great, but we could do these benefits without some of the negatives. And that's so instead of in saying it's the, the victory or the loss that matters, you're saying yeah. you can gain points for good behaviour, for not abusing the referee or whatever, those yeah, sorts yeah. of things. Well, well, it could be anything. Um, one of the, um, it's values, really. Yeah. yeah, one of the things we've written about in our book, we, we want sport to create young people that are able to work together in teams, social cohesion, all sorts of things. So why do we set teams? Why don't we mix teams all the time? Why do we say to schools, actually, you're going to play with these people? Why don't we, in our inter-school fixtures, mix up the two teams and say, well, actually, you're going to work with people you've never met before? Because that's what we do in life. Mm. And the score then doesn't matter because only Team A would win. It's not a school that wins, it's a team. Do you think professional sport, competitive sport, will have made you a better person for whatever you do afterwards? Yeah, definitely. And it, and it is now, you know, I work for various organisations, I work for a local organisation uh, as well as you Sport Trust um, called ECYPS. And we promote healthy living, we promote sport, we promote um, getting involved in inclusive activities. So this is just looking at everyone can get involved and push. And there will be a time, definitely, that I won't be. And school, um, sport for me has definitely provided a platform for me to be able to inspire and empower others, you know. I'm, but I was what young. about inside yourself? Mm. What, what has it done that is of extra value to you, other than the fact that you probably enjoy running or enjoy bobsleigh? I think, f for me, it's definitely made me a full-rounded individual. You know, from, from, I'm a, a local from Catford in South East London. I was raised by very young, and my parents were really young when they had me, and they never went to college, they never went to university. So if we were moved away from sport, they actually never pushed me. My dad was a footballer, my mum was a netballer, into sport, but was very encouraging. And the support that I, I provided me to keep pushing on has just allowed me to be able to be an individual where I can bounce back from almost anything. <laughs> you know, I could apply for a job, and I'm still going to, if I don't get it, you know, there's 14,000 applicants, for, for five item right now and it only a few people are going to get that but you're going to get turned down and it's dealing with that loss and being able to push through again right Emily I know there's lots more you want to say we'll have to save it for afterwards but Mike I, I said we were going to make this your family favorite um, you gave up cricket because a you probably couldn't compete but also because you realized that you were taking it a little bit too far um, you started sledging your own son in a cricket match which for those of you who don't know it means directing pretty nasty insults towards your opponent True. Well, there's the, the back the back story to that really. That was a game I did play a few years ago against against him, um, and 
it was it was pre and Ashes series actually, England Australia Ashes series, and I thought it'd be quite nice. I happen to have my England cap, and I've got and also I've got a baggy green, you know, the uh, the baggy green cap that nobody ever gives away. I've got one on the, on a hook behind the door. Here. That's the Australian one. <clears throat> so yeah, so I I I wore the baggy green. And it, it gave me this this kind of unnatural desire to to swear at my own child, <laughs> and I ended up questioning his parentage. And people said, "You you can't do that." So there's, then then they said, "Well, except to, except on the Jeremy Kyle show." So <laughs> and that was as that was as far as we got. But I did find that yeah, and I I still I, I'm not ashamed of it, but I found myself being even then quite competitive. What did it say about you? Final word, because we got to go. What did what did that say about me? Yeah, because you're smiling now. But what did it say about you? It it I, I was always like that. I was always competitive, and it didn't matter what level I got to. I wanted to I wanted to succeed in what I did. I th I think that going back to the whole point of the debate, it, it gave me a um, a reason for playing. It gave me it kept me fit. It did all those things. It gave me values. It gave me the appreciation of uh, of, of team sport. It gave me the appreciation of individual sport. All those things in life that served me well since. Uh, well, OK, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Please say thank you very much indeed to all of your children who have provided, as you put it, the, the backstory for this programme. Uh, good luck with everything that they attempt to do, and thank you three for coming in. Good luck with the, the training for the next Olympic Games or Winter Olympics? Probably the next Olympics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Montel, thank you very <laughs> much indeed. Uh, thank you for watching. We hope to have your company next time. But for now, we've crossed the finish line. For me, David Foster and the Roundtable team, bye-bye.